Hello everyone, welcome to part three in our series of Regents Biology Review videos. These are meant to help students review essential content in preparation for the Regents Living Environment exam in New York State, but they can be used as a refresher on a lot of other basic biology topics. If you haven't already checked out parts one and two, I encourage you to go back, use the links in the description of this video to find the other review videos. But here we go for our final review. This is focused on experimental design and scientific skills that might show up on the Regents exam. So in standard one, which is a large chunk of the Regents curriculum, there is a section on lab skills and experimental design, which is what we're going to be reviewing today. So a large portion of the test is going to be open-ended and you're going to need to focus on your skills of figuring out how to make observations and test explanations, um, develop proposals and hypotheses and obviously predictions, and of course think about how you would share your results and analyze and draw conclusions and then of course make revisions for future experiments. So when you're conducting scientific inquiry, there's a lot of different versions of steps of the scientific method and the experimental process, but this is just one way to think about all of the steps that you might want to consider when you're conducting an experiment, either theoretically or hypothetically or in real life. So first you want to make an observation. Um, you could then come up with a question about the observation that you made. Then you would form a hypothesis, which is a testable prediction, and it is generally written in statement form. A lot of teachers use the if-then format, which is fine in this case, um, but it's a prediction based on your research and your observation. So it shouldn't just be a crazy guess. Uh, it is something that can be tested. So hypotheses are testable. You're then going to construct a controlled experiment. We'll talk about controls in a moment. And of course, record your data, analyze your data, figure out how to present your data in a graph usually, and then draw valid conclusions from the data where you're either going to accept the hypothesis that you stated earlier, modify your hypothesis, or reject your hypothesis if your data does not support the prediction that you made. So when you're planning an experiment, let's go through an example here. Let's say a student is going to do radish seed germination experiments, which is a really common first experiment that teachers might have done with you in your classes. So first you might make an observation that seeds that you plant might germinate or start to sprout at different rates in different environments. So how come seeds over here on this side of my yard are germinating faster than the ones that I planted on the other side of the yard? And you might come up with a question like, could the type of exposure to light have an effect on seed germination at all? So if you want to make a hypothesis, it could be something like, if exposed to different types of light, the seeds in the lamp light or the artificial light will germinate faster than the seeds in the sunlight, for example. So that's one type of hypothesis you can make. It's not a very good hypothesis because we haven't based it on a lot of research, but this is this general format you could follow. Then you're going to conduct your experiment and you might want to design a situation where you have some radish seeds germinating in a petri dish in exposed to sunlight by a window and then some radish seeds germinating in a petri dish under a lamp in another part of your house and then you'll compare by measuring your dependent variable or measuring the amount of seeds that you're going to test and seeing which one performed better. So let's talk about data collection. There's different ways you can measure this type of experiment. You might want to see just how many seeds ended up germinating in our various light exposures. So you could count the number of seeds out of all of your seeds that actually started to sprout. And this is a type of quantitative data because we're counting. We could also take the quantitative data measurement of height. So in this case, we are going to take all of the different seeds in each of the conditions and we're going to measure each of them throughout the five days of various light exposures and then you can take the average as part of analyzing your data is you total them all up and then divide them by the number of data points you have to get your average or your mean data value. So these are just two different examples of data tables that you could set up in this particular experiment. Now when you go on to graph this data, you want to think about several different things, and there is a chance that you could be graphing on your Regents exam, and this is a different graph not related to the experiment I just showed you, but let's walk through different types of graphing basics that you don't want to forget when you're creating a graph. First of all, you always want to make sure there's a title. If you haven't already been given a title on the graph, you can add your own title. You want to think about your independent variable versus your dependent variable and how you're going to plot these. You want to make sure you scale your points appropriately on the graph that's provided to you. And then, of course, create a legend if necessary for any of your data points. Your independent variable is the variable controlled by the experimenter. So back to our radish seed 
germinating experiment. The independent variable here is the environment that I'm exposing my radish seeds to. So I, the experimenter, think I for independent and putting the seeds either in sunlight or in lamplight. That's what I'm controlling. The dependent variable is the data we're collecting and that is going to be what we are measuring in the experiment. So in this particular version that you see here, our dependent variable was how the height of the seeds and that is what we're going to be measuring. Generally in a graph, the dependent variable will go on the y-axis as we are creating our graphs. So this is the variable that is affected by the independent variable, but it's what the experimenter measures. D for data, D for dependent. A scale doesn't always have to start at zero on your graph, but it does have to increase in consistent increments. So make sure if you're going up by five centimeters, you keep going up by five centimeters on your scale for the entire graph. The scale should be labeled with what it is and what the units are. And then of course your legend is your description about the graph's data. Sometimes you might wanna circle each of your data points and create a legend or a key. So the circles mean this particular group. If you can't color your data, cause generally you only have one color to write with on the Regents exam. So time, sometimes you'll be asked to put a triangle around certain points and a circle around other points. Now part of science is that experiments can always be improved and they can always get better. We want to strive to make our experiments more valid. So ways to increase our validity are performing our experiment with a larger sample size. So in my radish seed example, again, I would want to do this with a lot of radish seed. Maybe instead of putting five in each environment, I would want to put a hundred in each environment. And that would make it more likely that my data would indicate something significant if I have a larger sample size. We also want to repeat the experiment again and see if we can get the same results. If we don't get the same results the next time we do this experiment, we know our results aren't very valid. And then of course, another way to increase validity is through peer review, which is when other scientists or other experts in the field look at the data that we've presented and say, okay, yes, these experimental methods look good. This is a significant piece of science. This is definitely a good way to increase validity. Some important scientific tools that you might want to familiarize yourself with or refresh yourself on are when to use and how to measure volumes in a graduated cylinder. So we have a short little graduated cylinder here, and when you're measuring a volume on a graduated cylinder on the Regents exam, it's probably just gonna be an illustration, but you're gonna look at the bottom of that meniscus, the bottom of that curve, and that'll tell you, in this case, it's gonna be 40 milliliters, that's gonna tell you where to read. So look at the bottom of the curve, and that's gonna be where you read your volume on a graduated cylinder. You also wanna make sure read measurements with a metric ruler, so these are centimeters, millimeters, and you'll generally again be given a diagram if you're asked to read a measurement on a metric ruler on the Regents exam and then try to figure out how long something is but make sure you know that each of the little small tick marks on a ruler with centimeters are one millimeter there's 10 millimeters in one centimeter Make sure you familiarize yourself with the different parts of a microscope as well. Remember the eyepiece or the ocular has magnification, it has generally 10x magnification, but then the objective lenses also have different magnifications and you can rotate them for the magnification that you want to look through. So in generally in a light microscope that you've been using in class, the low power objective might be 4x, meaning it magnifies things four times, but to get the total magnification, you want to multiply that by the magnification in the eyepiece. So there's 10 here, and if there were four here pointing down, four times 10 is 40x. And that is your total magnification for what you're looking at. When we're using a microscope, we can make different types of preparations on our slides. So you might have learned how to make a wet mount throughout the year, and a wet mount is when we take our slide and we want to make sure we get a cover slip and we're gonna make sure they're clean and then we're gonna place a drop of water or two, but very little water on top of the slide and then add our sample. And then the sample we wanna study is there and we'll be able to fix it in place with our wet mount. So then we'll take our cover slip and we're gonna place it at a 45 degree angle while it's touching the water droplet and then we'll drop it down. And then this is the best way to avoid bubbles and what it'll do is fix our sample there underneath the cover slip in the water and that'll make sure it's easy for us to see the interactions of whatever we're looking at under the microscope. You might also wanna use a stain in sometimes and that way we can highlight certain cellular structures and make them more visible for us to look at. So for example, if we're looking at the phases of mitosis on an onion slide, we might stain the nuclear components in order to see those chromosomes a little better so we could tell which stage of mitosis each of those cells would be in. You might have also seen uh, gel electrophoresis. Remember, this is where we are separating DNA th through electric current. 
and DNA is negatively charged and cut it into fragments and we put it in a gel, the DNA will spread out down the gel towards the positive end because negatively charged DNA is attracted to the positive current at the end of our gel. And our gel has tiny little holes and the DNA is gonna move through the small openings in this matrix and separate and the largest pieces will stay closer to the top because it takes them longer to move and then the smaller pieces will separate down to the bottom. And then we can compare either our markers that we know the distances of or the samples that we've collected to each other to see which ones are the most similar. Now we can use this in crime scene analysis and forensics to see, for example, instead of a marker, we would have the evidence from the crime and each of these samples would be suspects. We could see whose DNA matches the evidence from the crime. We could also use this for evolutionary analysis to see which organisms are closely related to each other or for something like paternity testing or missing persons identification. There's also a separation technique called chromatography that allows for the separation of pigments based on solubility that you might have seen in class, and that too could show up on the Regents exam. A few last minute safety reminders is to always wear PPE or personal protective equipment in a laboratory environment. If you're using heat, you wanna make sure you have an apron and gloves, but generally you wanna always wear goggles. When you're using something that has heating materials, you wanna point that glassware and the openings away from your face and eyes because you don't want something hot to splash up into your face and make sure you avoid explosions by not putting stoppers into test tubes when you heat them up and avoiding explosions that way. And you can see this woman here, she's wearing a protective apron, she's wearing gloves and she's wearing goggles in order to prepare her materials here. So that was a very fast review of some of the important laboratory skills and techniques that you might wanna be aware of for the Living Environment Regents exam. Best of luck, make sure you check out the other videos in this series and share them with a friend if they've been helpful. Give this video a like if it's been helpful for you and thanks for watching.